Oh, okay. Hi, everybody. This is uh, International Master John Watson, and this is Ask the Master on ICC TV. You may have noticed that I've been out of the country for a few months, and so this is the first show in quite some time. We're experimenting with some new formats here. Uh, the main idea of the show is to provide you, the listener and players, with a forum to ask questions about chess and the chess world. You can, uh, excuse me, notice already I'm having a uh, little conflict here. Let me get rid of, let me get rid of my sound here, folks. Let me, there we go. Getting rid of my sound so I don't get some feedback there. Um, the main idea, as I say, is to provide players with a forum to ask questions about chess and the chess world. You can send questions in advance to me, as people have done this week, and uh, or if you're tuning live to right now to watch the show, you can put uh, questions in the chat box, which I'm currently not seeing, but I hope I will see briefly. Um, so someone might want to try and put something in the chat box so I can see if I'm getting that. Um, so, as usual, we have to get a little used to the format here. Uh, it's been a little while, and it's slightly new for me. Okay, um, as I say, you can send questions to me by my email address, and that's askimwatson at chessclub.com. A-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at chessclub.com. I'll get that right away. We also have a Twitter channel, which is a hashtag Ask I am Watson, A S K I M W A T S O N. Anytime you feel like it, you can also send a, you can send a tweet there with a question for the show. And finally, if you want to, you can message my handle, John L. Watson, my ICC handle, John L. Watson. Uh, probably email is the easiest because you can then take your time and put a whole bunch of moves in if you want to, or go on and on. Whereas, of course, the message to the ICC is a little more restricted. So those are different ways to ask questions for the show. You can do it all week long. I would try not to do uh, too late, at the very latest, very early in the morning of the show, because I've gotten some just in just now, and uh, that's been a little tough to react to immediately, although I'm going to try and address them anyway. So that's kind of the basic principle of the show, or that's what's going on in general. Um, you can ask about anything related to chess. A few areas in which I have expertise are openings, for example. And um, since I've taught and played those and written a lot of books about them, uh, chess books, but anything about tournaments or players. We've got some interesting general quite chess strategy, learning techniques. Uh, we have some questions like that this week, which I thought I would actually start with since we, we tend to do a lot of openings. So maybe I'll do a few other things this week early on. So anyway, having said that, let's just start with the questions I have. I, ah, I see a chat. This is great. So you can go ahead and chat on live on the show, and I will try to look at those chats periodically to respond to them. But I think this first show, I'm probably going to do more of going over questions that people have already sent me first, just to cover them. And then, in fact, even for a couple of weeks, because next week I'm thinking of going back to some of the older sh shows and take some questions that I had actually missed and I never answered. But anyway, I've got some new questions for this week, and one of them is something a lot of people ask me, and I'm always a little reluctant to answer because it's so general and so difficult. And, uh, but I do teach, so I should have some kind of answer for this. Here's the question. What would you advise for someone who does well in the opening and end game, but often gets outplayed in the middle game? Now, obviously, if I knew the real secret to that, I'd be a great player and all my students would be world champions. But it's my experience is that it's just very different for different players and different personalities, partly because of the amount of work you want to put in. But I think you have to look around and see what you think is fun for you. Uh, that's very important. So I, I think if it's not fun, you're going to give up. You're going to, you're going to end up giving up whatever you're doing. So you have to kind of look at different methods of study and training and have at least some fun with it. It can't be all fun, obviously, because it's work it's, it's, to get better. But, but at least you should be sort of enjoying it or get into it. Um, so anyway, I think the best thing, if you have patience for it, is to do middle game training with exercises. And there are many books with middle game positions to study. And you could also just pick games yourself from leading players and just go into the middle game, preferably strong players. Um, and maybe you might even want to begin at the point where the opening is finished, really finished, well, well and truly finished, 
in an opening position and or a structure, it doesn't have to be the same structure, but in some kind of position that would arise from one of the openings that you yourself play. I think that's a good starting point. You don't have to do that, of course. You can just go take a classic game and go to the middle game, but that way you'll have just a little bit of a handle on the position and what to think about, and it will be practical because you'll get a kind of position that maybe you'll be seeing over the board in a real tournament. Okay, now what do you do with these positions? Um, what top chess trainers often do and they probably know what they're doing. Uh, this is with, with players who they start with pretty young, but it's just generally a training technique that the serious trainers use, which is they make you sit down at a position, usually at a physical board, with a clock ticking so that you have sort of a realistic situation and have you analyze the position within a certain amount of time. And write down your moves, uh, just like in a game, have a score sheet there, and and just try to analyze, and then after you finish, you'll look at what you said and what you wrote down uh, and compare it with what people played in the game or what they should have played or what the engine says. And, uh, but the point is it's a very disciplined thing. You sit, you take a certain amount of time. It's not a blitz game. You know, you take maybe, depend how much time you take per move, you use your common sense. If it's a very critical middle game, you might use 15 minutes on a move. And, if, and then once... If you if you want to then make a move and start over again, you can um, then take less time on some other moves, for example. And you'll you'll read top players talk about how they've used this technique. You'll see this, uh, or or their coaches have forced them to use this technique. Now that's a little boring for some players, and it's a little slow, and not everybody has that much time, and you, you may need someone there to hold a whip over you and force you to do it. So. Barring that, I'm thinking you can do something sort of similar, but a little more convenient using the chess-based training tools. So first you find some middle game positions. They can come from games collections. They can come from books. I mean, for example, if you have a training book with middle games, you can just find that position on the database. Or worse comes to worse, you can put the position up on a board and keep it in your database. And then you go to the training mode in chess base. And other programs may have something similar. But basically what that does is it makes the moves invisible. So you try to guess the next move, you make it, and then you get to the next move, but you can't see the, the moves after that. So you do really the same thing. You take your time, you pretend you're in a game, uh, and you do as much as analysis as you think you can. I think you should probably, even though you can't do this over the board, I would say you should write down some of your thoughts as you analyze. Just write down a few thoughts of what you're doing. Not, not every variation, but just so that you can remember later kind of what you were thinking. Just a few notes. And then uncover the next move and start analyzing again and go through. It's a great, great exercise. And um, I think a good thing about that is that any game you're looking at, these players are going to make mistakes. So if you've thought about the position, you may have been tempted by the same mistakes. You may make those mistakes, but at least you'll understand where, where all these moves are coming from, the good moves and the bad moves. And in any case, you'll get used to a realistic kind of position, a real world, a real realistic sort of thinking process. Uh, instead of what a lot of these books do, which is they, they have you solve some brilliant and profound position with some paradoxical positional move that's very subtle, and, uh, and it's a move that even a very strong player would probably miss uh, in, in, in practice, and you wouldn't be alerted that you're supposed to find a move like that anyway, so it's not very practical. So, so if you take a real game, and just take for with you know strong players that can be world champions or even just players that are just much better than you are, and it, it gives you practice making practical, uh, just well calculated decisions. How to make how to make decisions uh, in ordinary high quality games, not uh, unusual so, so crazy solutions of the type that you'll never really see in a real game or very seldom see in a real game, and you certainly won't see it again. So that's sort of a a superficial answer, but maybe something to get you started with for how to practice middle games. Okay, then um, I have an, another general question. Um, let me see if that's the one I wanted to do next. Um, I have a couple opening questions. I think I'll wait on those. So first, let's just see. Okay, there's nothing on the chat yet. Okay, uh, the question is, who do you think will win the candidates? Is there a matchup you're particularly looking forward to seeing? And is there some pairing that usually produces great games? And let me check my notes here. Give me one second. Let's see if I've got a note here about uh, how we're coming through. If anybody wants to uh, talk.
talk about the sound or anything like that, just tell me in the chat box if there's something wrong with the sound. Um, okay, so what was the question? The question had to do with the candidates matches. So I guess I should give a little um, background on that. The candidates is an extremely exciting event uh, because it determines a challenger for the world championship. So it's particularly important and particularly, there's so many of these super tournaments these days, and this is one that has everything at stake. So I think it's really a fun tournament, more than almost anything else there is in chess. And we also forget that Magnus Carlsen barely made it to the world championship. It seems like he's just a solid world champion who nobody can beat, but he almost lost out because he almost faltered in the candidates. He lost his last game, uh, played badly at the end, and easily could have been overtaken, which would have basically changed chess history. So these, th this tournament is important, and uh, especially the top players, it's pretty much everything. So anyway, the tournament is an eight-man double round robin. It's coming up very soon. Uh, in uh, March 10th, it starts. It goes for about three weeks until about March 30th, and it's in Moscow. So everybody, a lot of you people will be watching that on ICC, I'm sure. ICC is going to be showing all the games and have a lot of broadcasting going on. So the question is um, about players individually, but I thought I'd just name who is who is qualified. Hikaru Nakamura, you're gonna know most of these names, but in any case, uh, Hikaru Nakamura qualified, uh, Fabiana Caruana qualified, Sergei Karyakin, Peter Svidler, uh, Vishy Anand, who played in the last two world championships, uh, Veselin Topalov, Anish Giri of the Netherlands, uh, and Levan Aronian who uh, was chosen as a wild card, but is obviously one of the really top players in the world. So they're very, very top players. There's only two players that came to mind when I was thinking about it that you might almost expect to be there, or there's only two of the very, very elite players missing, and that would be, that I could think of anyway, which was Kramnik, uh, who is now, Vladimir Kramnik is now rated number two in the world, but that's not by very much, and it's kind of a coincidence because they just sort of go leapfrogging over each other regularly. But also Maxime Vashir-Legrov, who didn't even come close to qualifying because he was in sort of a down period, but now has climbed back to number five in the world. So he, so those are the two players that could be in that didn't make it. But in general, I think it's an incredible field, and it's pretty fair, and it's a really nice way to run a world championship, to really get the best players and give them all a chance, so there's no real luck involved. Um, the thing I think everybody agrees about with this tournament is that nobody has... No single player has a really outstanding chance to win. There's eight of them, and they're all very, very, they're pretty closely matched. Uh, certainly nobody has more than, say, a 20% chance to win. I doubt if anybody even has that much. I mean, their ratings are very similar, for one thing. And also, anybody who gets off to a good start, even a, even a lower player, uh, is going to be very hard to catch, because these guys are great at knowing how to draw, uh, how to take advantage of desperation on the part of other players. So, so there's a certain, and there's a certain amount of luck. I mean, maybe you're the player who is the beneficiary of a couple of blunders. It certainly happens. There's always some blunders, and if you, you might be the, the lucky one. Or your opponent falls into some extremely unusual, very unlikely prepared line that was not likely to happen, but you happen to benefit from it, and you get a free point or two that way. So, so this is a really tough question. I mean, to get an actual favorite is kind of... To get someone who's likely to win is really impossible. And um, But the really interesting and fun thing about the candidates is there's really only one prize. A finishing last is almost as good as finishing second. There's there's really just not much difference because winning is what you're, you're just trying to get into the world championship. And you can always fix your rating later. Uh, how you finish doesn't, doesn't really mean much for a tournament like this. So superficially, my feeling is that you would think at least that the more dynamic players, or at least the ones who win and lose more often than they draw. The ones who don't draw, the ones who tend to draw fewer games are a little more likely to win the tournament, just as they're more likely to totally bomb out and finish last. But but it seems to me that the, the players who are ultra solid would have a little more difficulty. Now, maybe that doesn't change the odds a lot, but it might change them a little bit. I mean, Anish Giri, for example, has been almost impossible to beat in the last year or more. and uh, But he hasn't shown that he's likely to string together a number of victories, and his style doesn't seem oriented towards that. Now that, you know, may not matter at all, but it seems to me it makes him a little less likely to win. Sergei Karyakin is an interesting case. Um, he can beat every lower player in the world, and he can hold his own against all of these guys, and he's one of the, he's an incredibly elite player. But I really wonder if the tiny kind of advantages that he, he gets from his openings, or uh, I wonder if it's enough uh, to convert. 
against these really monstrously strong players. So I wonder if he might draw a few, too many games himself. So, I mean, someone, whoever's going to win this is going to have to win some games and, uh, you know, hopefully avoid losing, but, <laughs> but you just can't, can't draw too many games. So if I'd have to pick a someone as more likely than everybody else, I'd go with Hikaru Nakamura because he's such a tremendous, he's been such a tremendous tournament player over the last couple of years, and this is a tournament. And I think he'll play very well in the high-pressure situations that arise where you need to pose serious problems, even in time trouble, he's very good at that, or saving inferior positions, which he's fantastic at, for the same reason. He manages to keep things obscure and keep his head at the same time. So I, I, I think, you know, if I was going to pick anybody, that I would, I would tend to lean towards him. And I was thinking maybe the second favorite, you know, other people can do that, like Anand, uh, I'm sorry, like um, Aronian and Tapala are extremely good at creating complications and working well in positions that are obscure. But um, neither seems to be in really peak form. So they seem a little less likely to me. Uh, so my second favorite, I guess I would say, is Fabiana Caruana. He's just so tough and he's so alert and he's... Um, he has a really good mentality, and uh, I think that at his openings, actually, maybe maybe that's the thing that distinguishes him most. If anybody really stands out in openings, I think it's him. He tends to get these small advantages and not be threatened at all as black. Uh, small advantages as white, and uh, so that's going to be tough to find a way to beat him. If it comes to that, it's going to be tough. So for individual matchups, which was the question, I, I was going to say that Nakamura is uh, versus almost anybody is going to be a fun matchup. I'm mean, just looking at the list, and they're all they're all a lot of fun. And the other two players that I think are kind of like that are Aronian and Topalov. They just consistently play fascinating games. So those three players, so I was thinking if I was just forced to watch a few games during the tournament and I couldn't watch any other ones, it would be the games between those three. So I hope that's a broad enough answer. In general, I think we're going to see a lot of conservative... Um, I think we're going to see a lot of conservative chess, particularly in the first half. That makes sense. Nobody really wants to just throw away the tournament early on until it becomes clear to a lot of players who they've got to chase and the fact that they really have to start winning at all costs. And when that happens, of course, I think the games will, will, will really sharpen up and get more exciting. Okay, let's see. Let me check the chat channel for just a second before I go on. I've got a couple of opening questions. Ah, we're doing some, uh, some advertising here for the... Uh, for the candidates. I'm going to be doing a little bit of that. Um, there we go. Okay, so that's that's a couple general questions I got. And then I got some opening questions as usual, which I think are fun. I'm going to try, the first one's a little specific, the other one's more generally applicable, I think. I think in the future I'm going to try to do opening questions that will help the maximum number of players. Um, I noticed that the ones we did before about irregular openings didn't necessarily excite the, um, the average player. So, so um, okay, so the first question is, every Benko Gambit book recommends the Kasparov Gambit. I guess I didn't really really realize that. If White avoids the Benko and plays the Anglo Benoni. Now let me show you what that is first. So what he's talking about is here, if White declines the Benoni with that move, that, that's the, the order that he's talking about. And then the Kasparov Gambit starts with this move, e5. Now, the other way you get to this, in fact, even the more common way you get to this, is with the symmetrical English, which is this way. And then here and here. And then if white plays here, black takes, white takes, and black plays here. Now, why is it a gambit? Well, it's not a gambit yet. The first point is if white's knight just goes backwards, let's say, uh, black freezes game, might even stand better already because of his big center. So this would be a tremendous system if white had to retreat his knight. But the reason it didn't catch on for many years until about 1980 when Kasparov played it is because everybody thought you could play here and play either knight d6 check next, or in any case, control this d5 square very strongly. And also bishop g5 is a possibility. So it's a little like a Sveshnikov. And for example, if someone did play a move like that, here, maybe here, I mean, maybe the sort of Sveshnikov-y position would arise, something like this. And people liked that for white, although I think it's playable for black. But it's not particularly good. Okay, so, so what... 
people came up with was was this move, and this is the one that Kasparov made popular, which is very natural. Now Black's pieces are all out, the knight's on an awkward square, and Black's fine in development and has the center. The problem is White takes that pawn, and Black can't take it back. And why can't he take it back? Because of the old trick. Queen takes, queen takes knight here. <clears throat> so that's why it's a gambit, is because, in fact, you can't take that pawn back, and you're a pawn down. However, in return for the gambit, you're getting all the space and time. And you make this move. And um, I used to teach this to my students. And I also wrote about it in several English opening books. But especially just uh, what, about four years ago, I wrote volume three of Mastering the Chess Openings. And I wrote about this. And so I know quite a bit about this. I've taught it to my students. I thought I knew a lot. But I haven't looked at it in years, really, now. And so I did some research this morning about this opening. And I just assumed that White was doing pretty well because I hardly ever see it. I hardly ever see this position. And I'll get to some specifics in a second. But um, it turned out, it was absolutely amazing that very few people at the very top are playing this order for White. So let me, let me explain that. Because they actually, I think, do fear this line. This line is doing tremendously well, by the way, uh, for Black in general. Uh, for a really good example of how it's doing well is that in correspondence chess, the top correspondence players, Black is doing extremely well. And the correspondence players, they win a pawn. They're winning a pawn. They make one more move, for example, or you know, an extra move or two. Uh, this is a typical position. So white's a pawn up. Black's not going to get it back for a while. And yet, in spite of that, uh, black has a very good record, better than black would normally get in a normal opening, which is, I mean, others, white isn't quite doing as well as he usually does in a, in a regular opening. So that's kind of a crazy result. You might ask, well, then why isn't everyone playing this? And what I discovered. I think maybe they are a little worried about this, and perhaps some other lines too here. Some people might be worried about other black moves in this position. But what I what I didn't realize, and I really should have, is that um, people aren't really playing d4 very much. They're playing this first. Then after a move like this, they play d4. After a move like this, they play d4 or g3. And the other move they make a lot these days is just g3 right away. That's very common. Not that many people are even of the very top of the top players. The, the, the master players, the strong masters. Not that many of them are even playing d4. And so my theory as of this morning, and I have to go check it more thoroughly, is that uh, probably some people are pretty afraid of this line. There sure doesn't seem to be anything wrong with it. Now, what's the point of the line? Real quick, we'll do that. I don't want to I don't want to waste too much time doing that. But let me just see. I made a few notes about what might be mentioned about this line that I thought would be interesting. Um, OK, here we go. If uh, Okay, uh, here, like I say, black plays here and black plays this gambit. But the idea is to get castled really quickly. We'll talk about the point in just a second. Um, now, I used to think, okay, white almost always plays this move. Um, there's a problem here that black is has ideas on this square, has things to do on that square. Queen b6 is a knight, g4 is followed by f5s and things. So it's a, it's a square that white wants to get castled as fast as possible, get his bishop out and castle. Now, I used to think... And I still think it's a reasonable idea that you could play back. That's a move you're going to play anyway. And then you can play here. That's an interesting way to continue. But I looked at some games, and black seems to be doing OK. Um, it's still it's a reasonable option for white if you want something a little irregular. Um, so, so let me see. So that's the main move. That's what people usually play. And black castles. And pretty soon you'll see what's going on here. Now, what white plays back here. If white plays the other knight back to c3, and he has to think about protecting this pretty soon, uh, then that knight has nowhere to go and gets kicked. And then there's even a move like b5 threatening to win a piece, and the bishop comes quickly, and you get your pawn back quickly. So that's why white tends to just come back. Usually these things kind of transpose. Um, so after castles here, um, now black plays this move before white can he wants to establish a wedge in the center and kind of isolate that pawn. And that's the interesting thing. The reason this eventually became popular, I think, is the fact that this pawn's hard to hold on to in the long run. You can hold on to it for a while, but in the long run, black has moves like queen here, rook over, knight here and here, or maybe pawn up and b5 and bishop b7. It's, it's just hard to hold that pawn forever. That's part of the problem. The other problem is that black has good attacking chances. For example, if white starts coming over to the king's side, you're going to have moves like knight here, knight here, bishop here, put a knight here, maybe put a queen here, 
all aiming at the king's side. Sort of a standard attacking idea. So black has multiple ideas here, and he has space in return for his pawn. He has space and act active play. That's the idea. And I'm not going to show you any real theory. The next move, sometimes white plays a3, sometimes white plays knight d2 here, but bishop e2 is the most normal move. And now I found out that even this old move, which has been played a fair amount, just overprotecting here, it seems to be working just fine. But the main move is working even better, it looks like. Looks like that's the way if you really want to equalize. And then here's an example. A lot of times white will play there, black will play there, white will castle, black will really protect this. He's pretty ready to take that pretty soon. And he has ideas like this and this, or here, followed by taking here, or sometimes bishop d6, like I say, or queen e5. And there's a ton of theory on this. There have been a thousand games or so, and it just turns out black has enough for the pawn. <clears throat> it's an interesting position because sometimes white will get the bishop pair. For example, black will end up putting, um, putting a bishop on this square at some point, not right away, but <clears throat> and then maybe after a3, and uh, maybe I could make some realistic moves here. Something like this here. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, here, maybe. Something like this. And what happens is that white is able to win the two bishops, which is definitely an advantage. But the problem is the knights are pretty well placed because that cramping pawn gives them nice squares to go to. There's a lot of nice squares. That the knights are almost as good as bishops here, is the idea. Okay. So, so that's about, I guess, all I wanted to say about that. All right. Um, let's see if we have anything in the, uh, do you have any questions in the chat? Or comments? I don't see anything. Okay, so there are some comments about the um, about the candidates. I think plus three over 14 rounds might be even enough to win. That's possible because they're pretty solid players, aren't they? Yeah, they're, uh, this is a great comment. Uh, I don't know if everybody can see that. Porco Spino 289 says that um, excluding Svidler and Karyakin, although Karyakin's quite a ways up there, and the other the other six are all rated in an 18-point spread, <clears throat> which is pretty amazing. And of course, one of those uh, you also have to realize that Anand, who's dropped some rating points, you know, he is, after all, the guy who won last time in spite of everybody's predictions. Uh, so we can never underrate him. Um, I guess I agree. Plus three sounds pretty good. We're talking about 14 rounds. Whew, that's tough. That might that might get you into a, a playoff or something. Uh, of course, there's always the chance someone can just start running away with it, like Topalov did in the World Championship back in, uh, way back when in Mexico, where he, um, he just sort of took over and uh, won, I think, six of the first seven or something. So that does happen, but um, but I guess I agree with that. I think that's a good comment. Um, maybe maybe I'd go out on a limb and say plus four, but but the, these people have to be so cautious. They know what's at stake. They're all good because they know enough not to press too hard, especially early on in the tournament. So so we'll have to see. That's a great comment. Okay, now let me see. I was going to show something else here. Let me. Examine another game. I'm going to ask you another, another question that just came in that fascinated me, and I think could be of real use to the average E4 player and and a Karakan player. So here's the game. It's in the Karakan panoff. And the question was, show you the question. Now this one I have kind of a lengthy answer to, so feel free to interrupt me on the chat, and I'll keep an eye on there because. So this will be a little bit of a survey kind of answer, just because I think people we might have fun. I always had trouble with the Karakan. And I think everybody does. It's doing very well right now for black. The Karakan is this, by the way, this idea. And the main lines are doing just so well for black. And this has been revised, revived strongly. Karpov's old line is doing very well, but so is bishop f5. And so what most of the top players have been doing for the last few years is playing e5. And the problem for the average player, the kind of player watching this show, even a, or even masters, is that it takes, it does lose a tempo, and black's pieces come out quickly, and you have to know a lot not to, just to get some, some positional disadvantage. And the theory changes all the time. It's actually very sharp. It doesn't look that sharp, but things happen very quickly. So it's a difficult line to play. It'd be nice to play something else. And an awful lot of players that, when I first got them as students, were already playing the, um, the pan off, which is this line, and then here. And it's a good, handy line to know. It teaches you a lot about chess. So the question is, if White wants to play a pan-off attack versus the Karakan, what's the difference be playing, between playing the traditional way, which is this, and playing c4 on move two? It's a great question. I think a lot of people have had this question over the years. But c4 gives you a chance to play uniquely and maybe avoid the main lines of the pan-off, which your opponents are going to know very, very well. 
So let me see if I can illustrate that. Um, what he's asking is what's the difference between what we just showed you and whoops, excuse me, and this move. And then after this, you do you do have a variety of choices. You could just transpose right back into the pan off. But he's saying, what's the difference? Can white do something else? I guess the first way to ask that is in reverse, uh, which is what what advantage is there to playing the normal way? And the only advantage, so to speak, um, is that you can force the main line. You can force that position. That is the Caro can pan off. And there aren't that many options now for black. Black doesn't have any special things that he can do that he might have against c4. So if you want this position, I guess you might as well just play the normal order, because black doesn't really have many options on the way there. Whereas after c4, he can really think about other things to do. So you have to learn some lines. For example, this is a possible move, trying to exploit that big hole on d4. And I don't think it's that big a problem. I think this is a good move. And um, the idea, of course, is just to take this. And if black has to defend that, well, now we have a little bit of a, now you have to like this position. You have to be willing to play this position. It's kind of an old Indian kind of position. Probably it's going to be if black plays here in bishop e7. Could even conceivably go into king's Indian, but probably not. And uh, you have to like this kind of position for white if you want to play this way. Because otherwise, it's not so easy to exploit e5. Um, and for example, if white plays this move right away, then we get a very interesting line that I always thought was OK for black. I used to play this for black in a different order that, ha that goes like this. And now you're threatening bishop b4 check and things like that. And if he decides to try to avoid this line with just, for example, um, well, against this, you do the same thing. You go here. And um, what else is there? There's a, uh, well, d5 is, well, uh, this is attacked. So yeah, I guess if here you have this uh, bishop b4 move. And maybe you're going to try and take two really soon and get something on the e file. So, so that's not a highly respected line. So you really have to be able to play this knight f3 line. But most people aren't going to play e5, and I don't think it's that good anyway. So um, what else? Well, after black plays here, then the question is, what, uh, what can white do to avoid the main line, just the very main line like that? And one thing he did for some years, and still does periodically, is plays this way. But I think black's fine here, this check. The idea is to kind of divert, maybe even win that pawn, uh, and divert black's attention. For example, if black goes there, then you can come back with some double attacking ideas. And uh, I think the move, just for the record, I'm not going to analyze it, but the move here is just fine. And then after that move, white defense is. Now, white can defend this for a long time. But it doesn't really matter, because black has all the time in the world to play a6. Maybe he'll play knight b6 at some point. Maybe he can even sacrifice a pawn, but because these are pretty weak anyway. And it's very it's complicated. You have to know this line if you're playing the black side of this. But um, in fact, one, one theme here, I'm going to just show you real quick. One, one of the themes is that white can actually play for the move d3, so that when black plays here and takes, you can take back with the pawn. That's the idea. So we'll. But I'm not, it's going to take too long to go over everything. There's a lot of theory on c4. It's been played for many years. So that's queen a4 check, which I really think black's fine against. Um, I think more interesting here, let me just, um, well, actually, let's just play through the moves that I gave. Is that right? Yeah. OK, so more interesting is just to play take twice without playing d4. Black plays here. Now, if black plays here, which he plays surprisingly often, actually, it's not the worst position in the world. You can compare it with the Scandinavian, but it's definitely better for white. He's gained time. It's a small advantage. So black almost, most good players are going to play this move instead to recapture with a knight and work against your isolated pawn. OK, now again, if you play d4, you're pretty much getting to the same kind of position you'd probably have in a pan off. And, um, so how does white deviate and play things that he thinks might be better than that? Now, first of all, if black plays this now, you don't really need to play that queen a4 check line. You can just put your pieces out. I used to play this line. Now, most people play knight f3 here. That's maybe slightly better for white. But I used to play this line with knight e2, where um, basically the minute he starts threatening knight b6, I would just play here for the reasons that I mentioned before about taking with the pawn if he takes here. 
And I got some pretty good games. I don't know if you're objectively better or not, but I think white has good practical chances. So that's g6. Um, so most everybody's going to play knight takes d5 here. And now if white plays d4, as I say, it transposes, so white just plays that move. And you might ask, well, what are the advantages? Now, in this game, black takes. This is Cyrus Lactowall's recommendation, actually, and quite a few games have been played. Um, you can play this move. This is the most, most normal move. It's probably the one you'll see most often. And then white does play here. And you might say, well, so what? That's just a normal Karo Kampanov. And it is. But let me real quick go back and show you what you've avoided by doing this as white. I think you've avoided something extremely important, which is that, let's say you go back into that normal Karo Kampanov here, and black plays here, and white plays here. This line is, is I think, really black's most critical line, because there's immediate pressure on the center, and white's supposed to play here. And there's this famous end game that Fisher played against Oiva, yeah, I don't know, 60 years ago or something. And um, it goes something like this. It goes here, here, and white attacks. It turns out black's fine unless white makes these moves, basically. And here, and now if black retreats, white gets a good game. So instead of that, black plays here. A lot of you have probably seen this before. And there's this crazy endgame. I, I don't know if it's worth looking at too much. But I can tell you about this endgame because my students have played it. And in fact, one of them lost as white, a very important game. That this is now, even though for years this has been in all the books, and you'll see all kinds of complicated analysis, there are several ways for black to get at least equality. And when you, after you get equality, there's always the problem that these pawns are so weak. And I just don't like this line at all for, for white. That's just my personal opinion, I think it's backed up with a lot of a lot of work over the years. I think I think the the line has gone downhill over the years for uh, for white. So if that's true, this is a really tough line because it's hard to know what to do. Black's simply going to develop and cut out, and he's got he's got nice pieces, and that pin is awkward, and there's pressure on that center right away. So you'll just have to take my word for some of that. But how do we avoid that? Well, with C4, uh, the line we just looked at, the one we uh, we were just doing here. Uh, let me go back. That was uh, this is this is fun to know. If this this now we're in a different kind of Karakam where he never had a chance to play bishop b4. So now if here you just play your normal isolated pawn attack for white, which is what you're after anyway when you play the Karakam pan off attack. And this is a wonderful position to get practice in, and you have all the attacking chances. So even if black's okay here, it takes an extremely good player. To be able to defend this kind of uh, this kind of position as black, and uh, if you go back and look at a whole bunch of my old lectures, maybe you'll see some examples. But this is a famous isolated pawn position that can arise from a variety of openings, uh, and you've managed to avoid that line I just showed you with knight c6 and bishop g4. So now normally that's not what black's after. Although black does go into this line, uh, so what are the options? Or the question is the question. Now one of them is this knight c3, which is what he played in the game. And the obvious question is, what about this? So if white plays here, we can go back into that line that worries me, where I think black is fine. And uh, a line that's had pretty good success against this is to, again, avoid... Now, some players, even top players, Bashir Lagrave, some people like that, have played this way. I don't think they've gotten that much out of it, but it's a way to play. It's a way to get a game and be out of the main lines. Your opponent may not know it. I think on other top players have played this move, and I think that's better. It gets a piece out really fast. And uh, you're ready to castle, and then play d4. And just get your pieces out quickly. So um, let me just say, uh, let me give you a sample line. Well, usually black plays here. See, black can no longer play the bishop out because there's too much pressure on c6. For example, a move like that would attack here and here. Maybe I take first, I'm not sure. But this is not, this is uncomfortable at, at best. I haven't analyzed it, but I'm sure it's not good. Uh, so usually they play here. And white simply plays castles in d4. I don't know what order. I don't think it matters much, I think. And now, if worse comes to worse, you can get that same kind of isolated pawn attack position that you were trying to get anyway. Uh, maybe if he plays a6, for example, you'll come back this way. But in the meantime, you just play rook e1, which is a move you're going to make anyway. And it's a very comfortable and fun position to play, in my opinion. That doesn't mean you're objectively better for sure, but it's, it's a position that you can... You can do good things with. So this is a way of playing against the Karo Khan that avoids some problems. Let's look at this game now, which would be, uh, let me see, back five moves. Let me uh, do this. Now the game went there. That's what Lactowall recommends and some good players play. They're trying to play kind of Grunfeld-y kind of thing with g6. And his analysis goes, 
I'm skipping some stuff here, but that's okay. Now you can, by the way, white can go kind of nuts here. And instead of playing d4, he can play h4 and just try to play h5. So that's kind of a fun idea. And he can also just develop. He can just play moves like bishop c4 and castles and don't commit to d4 yet. Castles, play rook e1. So you can do these things and have a fun game. The nice thing is you've now just got a regular old game, whether you're better or not. And that's what you wanted. So in this game, I told you I'd go on a little bit about this, but I think it's, I'm trying to give you sort of a repertoire for white here and also show as black what the problems can be, what some of the issues can be. Okay, this is uh, the main line that's been played a few times. This is what Cyrus gives, Cyrus Lactawala, here. And now I think here this move was played in some big game, and I'm just not very impressed with it. It's okay. I think white got a minuscule advantage at most. I think you should make a move you're going to make anyway. Black's big plan is to play this move queen a5 so that he can get e5 in without losing a pawn, or at least so he can sidestep and attack that at the same time. And you can go there and then go here. And it's true that a move like c4 isn't doing much good, even though it attacks the queen. But what is doing good is simply playing bishop here now because it threatens to take and then take a whole pawn without ruining your own pawns. So black pretty much is going to take. You can look at it yourself and see what, what the options are. Then you retake, attacking that queen, and you're in another one of these isolated pawn positions. It turns out black's best move is probably here, coming all the way back. But the main point is you're going to get this e5, d5 move in. And you'll notice he won't be able to take that because you'll take back with the queen and then you'll have bishop h6. And and you might not even play. You may not even play d5 immediately. You might play there first. But this pawn is not blockaded. It's quite a strong pawn. You're more active than black. You have an advantage. It's not huge, but it's fun and it's out of the books basically. So it's something that you could enjoy playing. Okay, so that's a long answer to the question of why you might want to play c4 instead of um, instead of just d4. So I, in fact, if I were playing against a Karakan, I'd be very tempted to play that move. I think it's more fun than, if I was looking for a pan-off kind of position. And I uh, hope that kind of covered that. I want to, I think every every uh, one of these shows, unless I get a ton of questions, I'm going to, um, oh, we got some questions coming in. Uh, I'm going to try to give some maybe fairly deep analysis of one line, maybe a 15-minute thing or a 10-minute thing, so that you'll get something practical. We have a good question about an E4 opening, but unfortunately it's getting pretty late, and I don't think I want to do the any deep things. Okay, so here we have something. We have a couple questions. Um, let me see. I'm trying to scroll up here. Okay, so I have, um, what do you recommend against the Stonewall Dutch? Is C5 ever a good move in the Panoff Bot Venic? Since we're talking about the Panoff Bot Venic, let me, uh, let me answer that really quickly. Yeah, there's some fascinating lines with C5. It depends if black allows them or not, is what it amounts to. Um, one one very interesting one actually is called the, I think, the Gundurum attack. And he actually, I believe he plays it right away. <laughs> he plays that move right away, which, of course, is just asking for e5. But there's a ton of theory. The basic idea is to play bishop b5 quickly and just block that square. Maybe play bishop here and take back there and just hold on to that square. It's kind of fascinating stuff, actually. It's a positional line. You can also do that a move later, for example, after the move I talked about, this move, you can play c5. I think the, the story with those moves is that if black knows what he's doing and, it's, and if you study it objectively from both sides, black is okay. Although I think white can, can probably maintain equality. I mean, it's a game. Um, what other c5s? Okay, let me show you c5. Now, it used to be that because I didn't like this line, okay, because of this, that I used to play the move bishop g5 here which is a main line. And black has a lot of answers here. Uh, DC is popular, even bishop e6 is played. e6 is played more often than anything, actually. So maybe that's the most relevant uh, thing for the, for the question of, is there ever a c5 that works? Um, let me just real quick, though, see if there's anything else worth mentioning. Oh yeah, queen a5 is fascinating. That goes on forever. I've, I've uh, taught this from both sides, actually. Um, and we can, we can talk, I'm, we're, I'm gonna get off the subject if I do that. But anyway, probably the main move, the one you'll see most often is this. It looks like that's a self-pin. Well, it is a self-pin, but on the other hand, the bishop probably shouldn't be out there that early is sort of the reasoning. And now white can, for example, play there. And 
if black plays slowly, uh, sometimes you'll get a good c5 move in, even if black plays fairly quickly. For example, here, this is a very interesting move. And the idea of c5 here is you give up pressure on the center, but what you're going to do is play bishop here and maybe take and just get complete control over that e5 square. Uh, there's a famous game that Anand played against, uh-oh, Karpov, I think. No, Kasparov played against Anand. It's probably the most famous game. That is based on this principle of playing castles, rook e1, and just sticking a piece here, and then he actually started attacking on the king side. That was all after taking here. And so it turns out black has to play really quickly here. If he plays really slowly, he can get in, he can get kind of tied down. I think this kind of position is not, maybe knight e5 should come first. Maybe not that desirable. Might be worth putting on an engine or something, or, or checking the exact move orders. But yeah, c5 can be played. And in fact, I have played it in the Panoff long, many, many years ago. But the exact positions you can play it in are fairly limited. I think this is one of them, actually. Um, OK. So that leaves, uh, what else do we have here? Go to Meroxi's profile page. Aha. We're discussing the pronunciation of Meroxi. In the King's Indian Defense, what do you recommend against the Auerbach variation? That's a long answer, unfortunately. Um, and I would have answered, if I'd gotten that earlier, I would have um, prepared something for that. I can show you two or three lines, but I'm wondering if it's worth it given our time situation. Probably not. So let's see if we can answer something a little more sim sim simple. What do you recommend against the Stonewall Dutch? Yeah, let's do this, because the other questions that I have prepared are going to take too long. So let's see if we can do something fairly quickly. Let me. Uh, back here. So we're talking about the Stonewall Dutch, which has to do with playing, probably everybody knows these moves, setting up a stone against White's position. And it's usually considered uh, particularly appropriate against G3 lines. So for example, if White plays here and Black plays here and White plays G3 or something, uh, and Black plays here and White plays here, and maybe already playing that move. And if white attacks, you just play like that. That's sort of your standard stonewall structure. In the old days, black used to always play here, like Botvinnik would play that move. And then now everyone plays bishop d6 instead. And the reason that people play bishop d6 is basically because um, if you play bishop e7, there's this idea about playing bishop here and getting rid of the bishops. Whereas if you play bishop, well, that's one reason. Uh, there's a couple of reasons. The other reason, the other obvious reason is bishop d6 covers the important e5 square. But one of the points was to be able to play there and at least discourage this move, bishop a3, force white to make another kind of move first, or maybe several other moves like bishop b2 and queen c1. Okay, that's the stonewall. Now, what do I recommend against the stonewall? I used to play right into main lines and play the move queen c2 and knight c3, and I found out that black usually couldn't take that. Uh, and then I like to reorganize with the move bishop f4. Now, I don't know about move order anymore. I haven't looked at this for a long time because I play other things against the Dutch, but um, there's a way of playing. <laughs> okay, how's this going to go exactly? Let me, let me just show you sort of a method I used to do, and I, the order is probably going to be completely wrong, but it goes something like this. And now let's say he plays, this is a little bit slow to play this move, but let's say he plays something like that. And you go here. And the idea now is for white, okay, you've got to, you're trying to keep that bishop bad. And the idea now is for white to reorganize with this move and this move, and then back again and winning e5, which looks incredibly obscure, but you've got a position that's sort of nicely prophylactic. It's hard for black to develop his pieces well in a position like this. So whether this is the exact order I would play or not, I'm not sure, but that's, that was, that's basically the idea. That's a, because knights are good against bishops in this kind of position. They may not be superior to bishops, but they're at least as good as bishops. So that's a quick possibility. You'd have to look into the move order there, because I used to play it against bishop e7, so I'm not real sure about bishop f4. Another thing you can sometimes do is play this and just say, OK, double my pawn, so at least I'm going to get going to get rid of your dark squared bishop. The easiest answer is probably to avoid the main line stonewall with some other order. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah, so what people usually do is they don't play. They, they, a lot of people these days are playing things like um, b3. This is uh, probably the most common way to play. And then usually you'll play c4 later. So this is, this is an easy way to play that's probably good if you, if you don't want to study much because the ideas are pretty clear and easy. You're just trying to control that square and trying to get your pieces out quickly. And I think I would probably answer c4 and then maybe put this knight here. So you can look up those lines. Okay.
what else we have? What do you think about the World Championship being asked for New York? I know it's exciting. It's, uh, I guess we'll, we'll have to get together an ICC tour to go to New York and have a cheering section. Of course, we don't know who it's going to be between. Maybe we can get uh, an American in there. We've got uh, Karawana and uh, Nakamura. And uh, I think it would be a blast anyway to, to go and, and visit and see. It will be interesting to see what the details are. But that, that should be a lot of fun. Um, so I love it. I think it's great. And uh, I hope I hope everybody considers going. I wonder uh, uh, what the – it would be like Super Bowl tickets. We'll have to get them early and get good deals on them and maybe buy extra ones and scalp, uh, scalp them and make a profit. I don't know. Um, should, should, anyway, I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's going to be great. Um, okay. Let me just see if there, people have asked other questions here. The problem is the things I prepared are probably a little bit too long. We could look at this Albert Block thing. Does anybody else have some comment? You actually can make a comment about the candidates or the World Championship if anybody feels like it. Do people agree about my Nakamura pick? As I say, I don't think he's more than 20% likely, but I think he's more likely than anybody else. That's my That would be my claim, that no individual has a really good shot. Someone else pick a guy. Who's, who's, who's your favorite for the uh, candidates? Who's going to win the candidates? Have any answers here? These three or four move horse trips. That's interesting. Ronan showed two of them by Bob Finnick, and Watson showed another. There we go. Yeah, he's talking about when you get semi-closed positions like this. Not completely closed, but pretty closed. Sometimes you have you have time to move the knights around a little bit. I guess the problem is there aren't that many good squares for the knights. There's that, and there's that. But a square like C, um, a square like, let me just make some moves here, even if they aren't good ones. A square like C3 isn't really that exciting. I guess B6 is common these days because it's not going anywhere forward. There's nowhere for it to reach into the position. And so that's why if you could get it to another square, I mean, if you could go, I mean, ideally, and you can't do this, but if you could, if you could somehow get knight E5 in and knight D2 F3, that might be a nice way to play. Although sometimes people call it, Devoretsky calls these redundant knights, so... Uh, because they, they cover the same squares, basically, as, as opposed to covering different squares. I'm sorry, that wasn't what I was going to do. I was going to go something like just make a move, and then if here, the idea is these knights are kind of covering the same squares, so they're not, they're, they're not, they should be covering the whole set of squares, not just the same ones. Also, there's a problem that you still got to get rid of that knight now. It's like a pseudo outpost. It's a good support point. But, but that's one solution. Black, uh, white gets his knights on squares that are just ideal in terms of covering dark squares. And the other solution is to do the, and the, but it shows why, why putting the knight here is a problem and how you might solve that is by zooming around somewhere else later. A knight here and a knight here are pretty good even if you don't play knight back to d3. And that's why you see in the Dutch, by the way, you see knight h3 a lot. Knight h3 is a fun move. It all depends on black's move order. But for example, in the, uh, well, in the Stonewall or or even the Leningrad, but in particular in the, um, sorry, uh, in the classical lines, for example, something like this. Karpov made this very popular, but a lot of people play this move, either now or next move, or, you know, there's timing issues, but uh, just because the knight's really a nice piece there, and it can swing back there to a nice centralized square. And you might think, boy, what a mess, but if the knight's on, a, sort of like, wow, that's taking a lot of time. But the point is, is if the knight's on F3, then, of course, a position like this, the knight doesn't necessarily have a lot of future. Aggressive future is the idea. So I don't know. I mean, that's maybe not the best explanation, but you can look up the theory on this sort of thing. I used to play knight h3. I, I think it's an enjoyable move. It also keeps the bishop open, so that's always nice, too. And so it means that situations like this look better than they usually do. If you've got a knight coming here, you're going to get more pressure on d5. Okay. Now, I don't know how we're doing for time here, but I think we're coming to a sort of an end here. Oh, we've got some comments. Let's do a few more comments. Ah, okay, Aronian was picked. Yeah, why not? I think Aronian was uh, my pick last time, actually. I just, I'm just wondering right now if Aronian is sort of in the right, right headspace for the whole thing. His last couple of years haven't been that great. I think he's, um, I think he's one of the most creative players, maybe the most creative player in, well, maybe even in the world. He's just a wonderful, wonderful player. The thing, one thing I like about Aronian is he's like Carlson in the sense that you can just kind of give him this position and nothing seems to be happening at all. And this is against the very best players in the world. All of a sudden he just sort of outplays them, finds some strange little moves and stands better. And it's just miraculous and 
mysterious. I guess I always like players I can't understand. <laughs> he's somebody I, I have trouble understanding. I, I don't understand how he, he... He's very good in very complex positions where that take, uh, that take original ideas. So, uh, and he is a great human being. Everybody loves Ryan. He's not just friendly, but he's also very helpful. And, uh, yeah, he's a great guy. Um, what do you think of a fine he'd played in the World Championship Tournament if there would, there would have been a different champion? I actually don't think so. I don't think fine was quite on the level of a person like Botvinnik or actually even Ryshevsky. Um He did have those great tournaments at the end of the 30s, but I, I just my own personal opinion, just looking at his games and... He was way up there. The most amazing player was Ryshevsky, uh in terms of being sort of underrated in history because he was within the world's top players for about 30 years. I mean, it's a pretty amazing, amazing record. And at one point, theoretically, at least number one by historical ratings. And uh, never really got the right timing to play world championship and, of course, was working. So, uh, great question. Uh, ah, we have two people who would love to see Svidler win. So that's good. And uh, everybody likes Peter. He's a good guy. And uh, I just am skeptical. I don't know why. Just because he's... <laughs> well, he certainly could win. All these people have a shot. There's no question. They're great players. And Svidler certainly has the right kind of experience. He certainly knows enough. He's got uh, you know wonderful practical abilities. I, I sort of... I don't know why I'm a little skeptical with, with, with Peter. He's... I mean... Uh, Maybe, maybe just consistency. He has to play a, a tournament where he plays well through the entire tournament against all these monsters, and it seems like he usually slips up a little at some point during a, a big tournament. But, but he's sure I mean, he's definitely a threat. They're all they're all threats. I'm sure this is a good time period for Peter to try and win because he's getting a little bit older, and these young guys are coming up fast. So this is probably a very good this would be a very good time for him to break through for sure. And uh, who haven't we mentioned actually? Well, he's also Vichy. I mean, you never know. You know, he really shocked everybody last time. And it's the same situation. Supposedly he's out of form. Or supposedly he, he, you know, is blundering a little bit or playing weakly. But I don't think he cares. I think I think this tournament he'll care. And that'll make all the difference. I don't think we can count on him playing, you know, like an old man, as they say. I think he, uh, I certainly wouldn't make him a favorite, but we just can't can't write him off. You just can't write off anybody. Topolov is such a genius. Um, and you get the feeling he's not as motivated now. Maybe he's not playing quite as well, but he was number two in the world just recently. <laughs> you know, I think within the last year, I think even. And, uh, you know, it's easy to underestimate these guys. Um, say Topolov got a little lead in the tournament. I mean, he, should, he could just take off because he's a player who, who feeds off of confidence. So, um, great. That's going to be so exciting. I'm really thrilled about this tournament. I hope everybody follows it. Okay, I think we've gone about the right amount of time and I will prepare a couple things. Send me uh, questions for next next time and you can also prepare ones to put on the chat and I will also look back. I noticed there's some questions that I never answered from people who loyally sent me things two months ago and a month ago and I'll look through those and grab some of the better questions there and do that. So thank you everybody and I'll see you next week.